morning. We'll be in the Psalms again this morning if you want to turn to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. I'll read it aloud if you'd like to read along in your own scriptures. Psalm 16, a mictum of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forever. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Father, we thank you, thank you for your word, for your written counsel to us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, Father, for giving us your spirit. And we ask that you would reveal your glory to us this morning, that our hearts and lives would be settled and strengthened in you. Bless our time, Father. Enrich us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. King David is one of the most notable characters spoken of in the scripture. There's one of my personal favorites, and it's not just because my middle name is David. It may be that as a young man that I was drawn to the action of the storyline. You have to admit, it is quite, a, uh, uh, quite an action adventure reading through First and Second Samuel. But as I grew older, the narrative increasingly meant so much more to me. There, there are many reasons to appreciate David's life story, but some of the most notable reasons are the fact that while he failed in some of the most devastating and sinful ways, he was marked as a man who had a heart after God. So much so that God weighed every king after him by whether they were like David or not. Can you imagine yourself having that legacy? Especially after so much failure and loss. Imagine God using your name to delineate between the godly and the ungodly. But this only serves to magnify the grace of God who forgives, who restores, who protects, and who provides. And it also demonstrates that the only hope of mankind is to humbly turn to God. And you can look over David's life and you can see the hand of God using all of his experiences to build him up, to build this heart of deep faith and trust in God. One experience after another, God demonstrates to David that he loves him and that he can be fully trusted no matter how dark the situation might seem to be in David's life. God communicated this. This psalm is entitled, A Mictom of David. This is the original writing. There's a lot of debate over what a miktom is. No one really knows. Some speculate it could possibly mean poem or writing. There is no definition for the word. Nobody really knows. It's worth noting, though, that there are six of these miktoms, and they're all written by David. And all of them 
call on God for deliverance, every one of them. Some even provide a reason for the title miktum. He says, it says right in the, in the title of the Psalms. Psalm 56 was written when the Philistines seized him in the city of Gath. Psalm 57 was written when he was in the cave and he was fleeing from Saul. Psalm 58 was written when Saul had men watching David's house in order to ambush and kill him. Psalm 60 was written during his reign when the, Edom, uh, the Edomites successfully attacked southern Judah while David was busy in the north fighting a battle. We don't know why Psalm 16 was penned. It doesn't tell us. But David's life was filled with many difficult painful, and even perilous situations. Even in this psalm, we can see it implied that there is trouble, uh, even a possibility of a loss of life. And it's on his mind. You just look at verse 10. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, only one see corruption. David's life seemed a continual stream of threats and distresses but these only serve to turn his heart towards God. And, and his testimony in Psalm 16 beckons us to do the same thing. And in the outline, uh, the, or the outcome of us turning to God is a confidence and joy that every one of us desperately seeks. Psalm 16 can be broken down in this way. And this is the outline that we're this morning and following where I'm headed. We will look at David's petition. We will look at his declarations. We will look at his testimonies. Confident joy. First, look with, look, look with me at his petition in verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. This is the only petition in his psalm. The only request that David makes of God in Psalm 16. And it could actually almost summarize the entire psalm. It is God in whom he seeks refuge. But he asks God, preserve me. In other words, Keep me, save me, God. Guard me, protect me. It may be that we all have been there at some point in our life, crying out to God, preserve me. But this was a very common type of cry that came out of David's mouth throughout his trials. For example, Psalm 17, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 57, be merciful to me, O God, be, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wing I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. Psalm 59, deliver me from my enemies, O God, protect me from those who rise up against me. Psalm 140, deliver me, O God, from evil men, guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Psalm 141, but my eyes are toward you, O God, my Lord. In you I seek refuge. Leave me not defenseless. There's many other examples through the Psalms, but these suffice to demonstrate that David always turned to God with his anxieties, pleading with God for help. Think of it this way. Imagine a family in David's time in the open country when suddenly... A massive army is moving across the valley towards them. An invading army from a neighboring country. And you're just out in the field on your farm. Knowing that certain catastrophe is about to take place, you grab everything you can, you grab your family, and you run where? To the nearest stronghold. You look for a fortress, some place for protection. It makes perfect sense. You can't stay here. There is no protection here out in this open field. Still, what fortress is there on earth that can protect like God? What is there? All earthly 
strongholds can be broken into. They can all be besieged. There is no surefire protection from anything on earth. David says, no, I will entrust myself to God. In him, I'll take refuge. And do you realize that pleasing, that it is a pleasing thing in the that he desires for us to turn to him, to cry out to him? He desires for us to do that. He wants you to cry out and express to him your pains and your fears and your anxieties, your, your frustrations and your hurts. He wants you to express it to him, to tell him about it. I think sometimes we are afraid to do that, I, I, thinking that we're somehow out of line by talking to God that way. We feel that maybe God doesn't desire us to speak that way. Turn to Him and to be honest, in honest dependence on Him, expecting Him to hear us and care for us as His children. He wants us to come. And can I say for a moment that I planned on using Psalm 16 weeks ago? This wasn't a plan. This wasn't uh, uh, something that I concocted in my mind. I'll work with, with Josh here. I had no idea what he was going to speak on last week and, and the manner in which he was going to do it. So this, this was all by the provident hand of God that we're here this morning listening to Psalm 16. Last, last week's passage was 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This was David's posture towards God in, in Psalm 16. That was his heart. God, you, you alone are my refuge. The name for God here is translated El, or is translated from the word El, the name El. It's rather a generic name for God. You see it all over in the scriptures, even used of false deities in the Old Testament. But the name also carries with it a connotation of strong or mighty. David had confidence that mighty God, he felt certain that mighty God was his safety, his security. And this moves David to make some very strong declarations, starting in verse 2. He makes some very strong declarations for himself. He says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. What is David saying? Is he stuttering here? Lord, you are my Lord? Seems rather redundant. Well, it helps to know that he's using two different names for God here. The first is Yahweh. It's the proper name for God, the God of Israel, the one true God. The name Yahweh speaks of God as the self-existent one. Nobody created him. He is eternal in nature. He is the I am. He has no beginning. He has no end. No one created him. He created everything. He's eternal in nature, and besides him, there is no God at all. And the second name here that he uses is the name Adonai. So Adonai means master or Lord. The name, uh, it's, he's, he's recognizing that, that God has the right to rule over him by using that name Adonai. He's saying, Yahweh, I want to trust you, and I want to obey you. You are my master, you will be the one. Your will be done. David was willingly placing himself under God, and he was fully entrusting himself to God. And this was the same posture that Jesus used, if you remember, in the garden. To be betrayed, about to be betrayed. And he's pleading with God. He says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Why make this determination? David says, 
because I have no good apart from you. Where else is a person going to turn? To what? You're the only thing, and your will is always best and produces the best. You're the only place I can turn to. It's foolish to think there, there is someone else or something else that is better to entrust yourself to. It's a foolish place to go. Happiness, hope, life, safety, salvation. In the truest sense, David recognizes that these cannot be attained without God. They can't be attained. He says, I give myself to Yahweh. I entrust myself to Yahweh. Where else will I turn? Where, where else could I go? That is where real peace and real joy resides. I'm submitting myself and entrusting myself to God. But David points to another source of joy. This is his next declaration, verse 3. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The saints, the sanctified ones, the holy ones, the ones that you, Lord, have set apart for yourself to bear your name. They're sacred to me as well. Remember the psalm from a couple weeks ago, Psalm 84? Remember that? Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are the highways to Zion. Remember that passage? Do you remember for a day is better than a thousand elsewhere? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house, in the house of my God, than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. These are the people, Lord. These are your people. And, and I know that apart from you, I have no good, so I delight in your people. They're also God's provision. They're God's provision, providing strength and joy as they point us back to God. David describes them as the excellent ones. It could also be translated majestic or beautiful or glorious. In your people, God, I find some of my delight. No, that's not what he says, is it? No, he says, I find most of my delight. Right? No, that's not what he says either. No, David says, I find all my delight in your saints. There's, there's no division here. It's all there. He is saying that the saints of God are the most valuable treasure to him on earth. There are a lot of earthly things that we delight in, that we take joy in. But David says all of his delight is found in the saints of God. I love you, God, so, so I love them, and I find all my pleasure in them because I find my pleasure in you. This includes the odd person. Could be me. This includes the difficult person. This includes the person that may at one point have hurt you badly. I find all my delight in them. In every situation, at all times, even we are to love those who love God and our greatest pleasure should be in our fellowship with them. This one issue is such a huge indicator for us too as to the state of our heart towards God whether we love his people. And the opposite is true regarding those things that blaspheme God. We shouldn't want to take part of them. And that's David's next declaration. I don't want anything to do with it. Verse 4, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. David found great goodness and delight in and in his people, but those who run after another God, 
have only compounding sorrows or sorrow upon sorrow. It's not, it's not just a bold decora- declaration. It also serves for us as a warning. Don't go after that. Don't go after those. And the sad thing is that even many followers of God turn to something else for an answer, don't they? That's why it says here that they run to it. He uses the word run. It literally means to flee or to go quickly or to make haste. They're ready and willing. It's not like they have to be persuaded. They're ready and willing to turn to something else because they don't see God's way as the best way. Or they simply don't trust God. God obviously doesn't care. It's the pattern of fallen flesh, to distrust God, to seek another path, to seek something else to satisfy. It reminds me of Jesus' parable of the sower. You remember, he says, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a little while, and tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. This was the problem in Israel. You know the narrative of Israel. From the very beginning, they constantly turned to gods of their own making, gods that they thought could provide what they wanted, but these gods didn't deliver anything but devastating sorrow. They never trusted the one true God. They wouldn't submit to him. They wouldn't obey him. They wouldn't delight in him. Sorrow, pain, anguish always accompany the worship of any other thing than the one true God. But David, in a sense, was all in. All his chips were in the center of the table. All his eggs were in one basket. Yahweh is his Lord And his only hope, he knew that good is only found in trusting and in submitting himself to God. And he would not even participate in the worship of another, or even, he says, not even speak their names. He would not even speak the name of their God. He didn't want any familiarity with it. God, you are my Lord. Single-minded focus. He says, their drink offerings of blood, I will not pour out. So drink offering was a very common thing in the Near East, even uh, in the time of Israel. We first see this in Genesis 35 when God blesses Jacob. Remember, he changes Jacob's name to Israel, and he establishes his covenant with Israel. And it says, Jacob removed all the foreign gods and even the symbols of those gods from among his tribe. And he says, Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with God, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. That's our first mention of that in the scriptures. But that also becomes a regular routine thing within the nation of Israel, these drink offerings. It was a form of worship. Just as a grain offering or offering a blood sacrifice, a burnt offering, it was just a way of symbolizing your worship, and it was also a means of making an oath, of devoting yourself. It was binding yourself to the object of your worship. Again, this was a common practice even in the worship of false gods. Sometimes a drink offering was wine, Other times it was wine mixed with blood. And this is one of the many reasons why God said, you will not drink blood. It was a command of Israel. But usually it was poured out. Sometimes it was partially ingested by the worshiper and then the rest poured out. So, But David says, I refuse to participate in the worship of another. I will not bind myself to another God. I will not do that. I don't even want to speak their name. David's declarations, Yahweh is my master. His people are all my delight. And I have nothing to do with any other means 
of worship than my one true God. These are his declarations. Finally, in verse 5 and 6, he declares, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. This seems a bit confusing at first. Lots and cups and portions and inheritance. What is he talking about? For us, it may be kind of confusing. But I truly believe that what David is doing here is making an allusion to the tribe of Levi in Israel. What do I mean? If you remember, all the tribes of Israel were given a portion of the land when Canaan was conquered. But Levi, the tribe of Levi, did not get a portion of the land. Do you remember that? Instead, it was the tribe of Levi that was given the great honor to be the priests who served in God's temple and worshipped constantly. And God told Aaron, you remember this in Numbers 18, before the promised land was even conquered and they, they divided it up. And Aaron says in, in Numbers 18, you sh- uh, God said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in the land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the peoples of Israel. Moses repeated this in, in Deuteronomy 18. He reminds them, he says, the Levitical priests all the tribe of Levi shall have no portion or inheritance in Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings and their inherit- as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. So what is David saying here? Well, I'll tell you what David's not saying. Let's start there. David's not saying that he is going to take on the role of a Levitical priest. That's not where David's going here. That was not his place in Israel. God didn't commission him for that, and he would have been sinning against God if he had tried to do such a thing. So he's not trying to become a Levitical priest. No, I believe David is making an allusion to the uh, inheritance of the Levites in order to communicate that God is all he has and all he wants. He's all that he wants to inherit. He doesn't want anything else besides God. He's saying to God, you are my portion. You are my cup. You are my lot. You are all the inheritance I want. You're all I want, God. To his core, the psalmist feels that he has no strong bind to anything on earth None of it is meaningful to him. Only God is his treasured possession. You are my beautiful inheritance, he says. Let me tell you, anyone who has made God their most treasured possession has chosen something that can never be lost and is superior to everything else. What is more, they have chosen that which is supremely good for them the most satisfying, the most trustworthy, that which brings actual joy and contentment. Again, David was all in. God, you are all that's valuable to me. And he was a king with a true worshiper's heart, wasn't he? Yahweh is the one he would trust. Yahweh is the one who would be his master. Yahweh and his people were his delight. Yahweh alone would he worship, and Yahweh was what he treasured. These are David's declarations. Now let's look at his testimony. Verse 7. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. God had always revealed himself to his people, hadn't he? Particularly the people of Israel when God had presented a written revelation. They had a written word from God. God had freely given counsel to his people. But what counsel could a false God give? Nothing other than what we pretend they say. We have to make something up. What kind of good counsel could any man give us unless it first comes from God? Nothing. 
It must come from God. David walked in stability and could make wise decisions because God graciously gives him counsel. He says, even at night, his heart instructs him. Have you guys ever been there? Where your heart instructed you in the night? Have you ever done that? Have you ever meditated on God's word in the middle of the night and found peace? I, I could tell you on my own account, in some of the most painful periods of my life, I've, I've awakened in the middle of the night and prayed and started reciting to myself and to God all that I know to be a true about him. To remind myself, I reminded myself of how wonderful and powerful and trustworthy he is. How his love and his goodness toward his children is unquestionable. And I remembered the scriptures that speak of his faithfulness. I recited them in my mind and I prayed them to him. And I also reminded myself that I would always rather have his will for my life than my weak understanding and my weak expectations of what was best. And the result of all this was a loss of anxiety and sweet sleep. I was able to rest. Have you ever done that? Woken in the middle of the night, and it was God's truth that counseled your heart? David's heart was instructed by God's word, so his heart could properly advise him according to God's ways. That's why you, you look at all the Psalms where David boasts, uh, your word is more precious to me than gold, the finest gold, sweeter than honey, the drippings from the honeycomb. It is the best possible thing. You could read through one, Psalm 119. We, I joked about doing one sermon in Psalm 119. I just don't see it possible. <laughs> he delighted in God's word because God instructed him. Night and day, God's word instructed him. And I genuinely believe that our strength and stability as his children are directly related to what we understand about our great God and his love for us. That's what causes us to stand strong. David understood this. He said in verse 9, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. The right hand was an allusion to strength because most people were right-handed. It's not to diss on the left-handed people, but it's, it's just a reality. Most people were right-handed, so it was viewed as the hand of, of strength and power and control. It was the hand used to defend yourself against a foe. It was the hand that you most prominently used to supply your needs. We see this in places in the Psalms, like Psalm 1835. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. Or Psalm 10931, for he stands at the right hand of the needy to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. There's many, we could go on and on and on, there's many that speak of the right hand. There are many other examples, but David, in these two verses of Psalm 16, is testifying to God's faithfulness to him. God has always been his counsel and his strength because he has always put God before him. He believed God's truth and he believed in God's power and his faithfulness to provide and protect and deliver, and so he doesn't fear. God had done it before. You look at David's testimony. He, God does it over and over and over again. He said, God's, God's always done this. He's given me counsel. He's given me strength. And he'll do it again. I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. I, I won't be fearful. Why would I be? And that's why he concludes his psalm with some confident joy. Confident joy. He seems to be facing great loss or danger, remember? You remember that? 
He's facing some kind of traumatic experience. But look at verses 9 and 10. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. In the very beginning, we saw he was terribly disturbed. Preserve me, save me, God. Deliver me. There's something big happening in David's life, something dangerous. Seems to be facing a loss, but he resolves himself to trust God, to give himself into the hands of God, to follow, to worship, to love him above everything. And he remembers that God has always been his counsel and strength. The result is great joy and peace and confidence, just like that sweet night's sleep. My heart is glad. My soul, my inner being is glad in the midst of trial. In fact, he says, my entire being rejoices. There's no aspect of me that is not full of joy and confidence. He didn't say this problem was solved, does he? He doesn't, by the end of the psalm, say his his trouble is gone. It's not there anymore. It's still there. But he says, I I don't fear. Why would I fear? I belong to him. He is my Lord. He is my inheritance. What, What do I fear? Death? Do I fear death? He won't abandon death. Verse 10 is so familiar to us, right? For a very good reason. But on one hand, there is this immediate context When David is speaking this, I believe he's speaking of himself. He's saying that even death, God won't forsake me in the grave. He seems to be entrusting himself to God that there is a resurrection and I will see him and I will be with him. He won't leave me down here and he won't leave my corpse over here. God will not leave my soul in Sheol and he will not leave my body in the ground. But listen to Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. As he's preaching to the crowd on Temple Mount on the day of Pentecost, he said, God raised up uh, Jesus up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, and he's quoting from Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Isn't that amazing? Peter's claiming here that David knew the ultimate fulfillment rested in this future descendant that God was going to put on his throne for eternity. God had promised these things. He was looking forward with anticipation to this one who would resurrect in power. He would not see decay, ever. And he would raise from the dead. And that resurrection hope was... David's hope as well. Verse 11, you make me to know the paths of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. No trial, not even death, posed a threat to David because he knew that even death could not break the blessed fellowship he had with God who was his very best. Why would I fear death? I don't even fear that. 
he starts at the beginning, oh, God, save me. By the end, he's like, huh, why would I even fear death? He reminds his heart. God is his life, his full joy, his pleasure now and forevermore. No matter what bad thing happens to him, no matter how terrible things become, you couldn't remove this confident joy. And sadly, we all face trials. Every one of us. There is no exception. Trials and tribulations are not foreign to us in this corrupt world. We face them. Some trials are more tur turbulent than others. I'm, I'm not saying everyone's trial is exactly the same in its magnitude. David was constantly under stress. David, David would have the right to sit here and boast of his trials. I don't think most of us will ever experience the magnitude of what he did in his entire life. He had to run for, for his life from Saul because Saul was after him. He had to fight for his life against many adversaries. He had to deal with horrible consequences and shame of his sin with Bathsheba. There was a constant turmoil in his household, constant political turmoil in Israel, constant turmoil with the Philistines and all the neighboring adversaries, the intense battles that ensued, and much, much more. He was constantly in fear. His, his life seemed a constant stream of pain and struggle and loss and fear. The point is that David is not simply writing this to remind himself where his hope lies, though I am certain that it had that effect. God is also communicating to us the path of joy and stability. We all need to hear about this. We need to remind ourselves since we all struggle, particularly we who are the holy ones of God, His children. He loves us. He, he desires that we would have the peace and joy that comes from completely trusting Him. All in. Our greatest good is found in Him. Not in any earthly circumstances working out the way that we want them to. If you're looking for peace in that, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But God wants us to cry out to Him. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to desire Him above all else. He wants us to be in fellowship with His people. He wants us to trust in His counsel, to rely on His strength, because our fullness of joy can only be found in Him. God wants you to know that He loves you. He wants you to know that full joy is only found in Him. It's only found there. In closing, I want to read to you one more time from our passage last week. 1 Peter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. So, Father, we ask You because we are so fickle and weak. We are so tossed to and fro by, even in a moment, a circumstance, can arise and we become apoplectic over it. Lord, you are to be trusted. You are worthy to be trusted. You are glorified when we trust you. And we cause our own, ourselves only pain and difficulty when we fail to trust you, casting all of our anxieties on you. Lord, we ask that you would deliver to us the peace and the joy that can only be found in remembering who you are and what you have promised to us and your faithfulness that can never be ignored. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for loving us as your children. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.